Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, if you were listening to this on time, Merry Christmas Eve to you, 2020. If you're not listening to this on time, you missed the holiday spirit, the Christmas spirit, but that's okay. I'm wishing you and yours a very, very Merry Christmas. Try not to get lost in all the materialism and all the nonsense of 2020 as we get into this Christmas season, but just wanted to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. But today, we're breaking down the best books that I read in 2020. And if you stick with me until the end of this episode, I will give you what I consider to be the best book that I read in 2020. So, Definitely stick with us throughout this entire show. So I've done this every year that we've done the podcast, but let me just flow a little bit on how I read. So as I've told you guys a lot before, I'm not a huge reader in that I don't have an eidetic memory. I don't have a, a an ability to read quickly. Uh, I have to reread stuff. Uh, it, it, my mind kind of wanders, especially when I read fiction. That's why you're not going to see a lot of fiction on the list today, but I just read when I can. And so one of the best things that I do in terms of reading is I do almost 100% of my reading on my phone, okay? I do that on the iBooks uh, app on my phone that I have on my iPhone. I don't really mess with paper books. I'm I'm actually reading a paper book right now, a hardback book, but that's not really something that's super convenient because again, if you're getting your oil changed or or maybe you're waiting uh, for your wife to get done doing something at the store or you're, you're just somewhere where you're not by your nightstand where your book is, you can just pull out your phone and take down half a chapter, read an entire chapter. Who knows what you're able to accomplish in that time? But that's the way that I do it. Even if I'm just reading in the house by myself or something like that, I will just sit there and do that with my phone. It's very easy for me to take notes on my phone right there. You can just take it right there in the app. I highlight stuff. Guys, when I went back to do the best books of 2020 that I read, if I didn't have those highlights, if I didn't have those sections, I would have kind of forgot some of those things that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So that's how I read. But here's the thing. One of my favorite quotes from one of my buddies, a buddy of mine named Matt, he said, uh, and he said this to another buddy a long time ago, but it's like, there are people that read and then there are idiots. And to some of y'all that might seem harsh, but that's just the way that it is. Because again, I talk about this all the time. The number of guys that I know that don't read is astonishing. They don't read any books. It's like, hey man, how many books have you read this year? They're like, read books? What am I in high school? It's like, really? Did you also stop maturing whenever you graduated high school as well? Because the thing guys is that is how you stave off depression. It's how you stave off dementia. It's how you infuse your mind with things that you wouldn't learn otherwise from the television or even from podcasts or something like that. And yeah, of course I'm a big lover of podcasts as you saw in last week's episode, but guys, the, the, the people that just spend their time watching television and wasting their brains away, just rotting their minds, watching Netflix. It doesn't make any sense. So you got to be reading. And, and I don't really care how much you read. I don't really care how many books you take down in, in a year. I know people that read over 100 books every single year. I'm just never going to be that guy. I'm between 20 and 30 books every year. That's fine for me. I take in a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of other things. But guys, you have to read. But as we move forward into the award show for today, how I do the list is I've got 11 different awards. Most of the awards are the same as last year in in terms of the category, but I've switched a few out. And here's the thing. This is very, very important. The books that I'm putting in this list, most of which were not released in 2020. Okay. So I didn't just exclusively read books that were released in this year. So that is one important thing to keep in mind is there's going to be books from all over the place. These are just books that I read during this year. So without further ado, Let's go and hop into the very first award for best books of 2020. So the first award is the most interesting book of 2020, and that is Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, A Response to Evangelical Feminism. This is by John Piper and a bunch of other people. I think there's over 20 authors that contributed to this particular book. It was released in 1991 originally and then re-released in 2012. And one thing I'll kind of give you an idea is uh, in terms of how I'm going to be introducing all these books. I'm going to read to you the, the description from Amazon because sometimes whenever you do these podcasts, whenever people are doing like best book podcasts or something like that, they're kind of giving their own summary of a book and sometimes their summaries just aren't very good. And I I'm going to give you all a very accurate representation of what these books are so that you can find the ones that you think will be interesting to you, add it to your reading list for 2021. So I'm just going to read the stuff from Amazon because this typically comes from the publisher and or the author. So that's what I'll be doing. Then I'll kind of be giving you the reasons why. So here's a description of recovering biblical manhood and womanhood. A controversy of major proportions has spread throughout the church. Now more than ever before, gender roles are openly questioned in the wake of evangelical feminism, a movement that is having a profound impact on society, 
the home, and the church. More than 20 influential scholars such as John Piper, Wayne Grudem, and D.A. Carson have committed their talents to produce the most thorough response to date. Combining systematic argumentation with popular application, this volume deals with all the main passages of scripture brought forward in this controversy regarding gender-based role differences. Anyone concerned with the fundamental question of a proper relationship between men and women will want to read this book. So the reason why it's the most interesting book of 2020, uh, this is a book I actually started in 2019 and then read through. It's close to 600 pages, but it is an incredibly dense book on a singular subject. In the singular subject there, it's voluminous in terms of what you can read or think about those subjects. But I'm a guy that obviously spends a lot of time thinking about manhood. And if you're thinking about manhood within the church, you're going to be thinking about womanhood as well. But most people are just assuming that there's not really a controversy there, or they're just going with the the attitudes that are pre- presented from the pulpit at their megachurch or something like that. So this really gets down into egalitarianism and complementarianism. Um, and the the authors, they, they all come from so many different perspectives. And to have this many heavy hitters in one volume is pretty impressive. I will say that you can kind of get into the weeds, and some of the chapters do get into the weeds uh, about the Greek, and they're a little bit more theological. So if that's not really your, your cup of tea, uh, I wouldn't avoid avoid this book, but just know that going in that there's going to be some sections that you're going to be like, wait, what, 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 you know, they're, they're talking about the context of this particular uh, obscure Hebrew word or something like that. But it was a very, very interesting read because there's always more going on below the surface than what we realize. The modern church has become incredibly feminine. That's the reason why a lot of men in the church are incredibly feminine. That's why a lot of people that work at the church, a lot of the pastorate are incredibly feminine and it's not an accidental thing. Society is helping push this, but it's also a cancer from within. So that's why I think that is the most interesting book. But I will give you my favorite quote. I'll give you my favorite quote from all these books today. And this is my favorite quote from the book here. Quote, if I were to put my finger on one devastating sin today, it would not be the so-called women's movement, but the lack of spiritual leadership by men at home and in the church. Satan has achieved an amazing tactical victory by disseminating the notion that summons for male leadership is born of pride and fallenness, when in fact, pride is precisely what prevents spiritual leadership. The spiritual aimlessness and weakness and lethargy and loss of nerve among men is the major issue, not the upsurge in interest in women's ministries. So that is my favorite quote from the book and the most interesting book of 2020, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, A Response to Evangelical Feminism by John Piper et al. All right, next one here. The most timely book of 2020, that is How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps by Ben Shapiro that was actually released this year. And this is the description of that book. A growing number of Americans want to tear down what it's taken us 250 years to build. And they'll start by canceling our shared history, ideals, and culture. Traditional areas of civic agreement are vanishing. We can't agree on what makes America special. We can't even agree that America is special. We're coming to the point that we can't even agree what the word American mean or word America itself means. Disintegrationists say we're stronger together, but their assault on America's history, philosophy, and culture will only tear us apart. Who are the disintegrationists? From Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States to the New York Times 1619 Project, many modern analysis view or analyses view American history through the lens of competing oppressions, a racist and corrupt experiment from the very beginning. They see American philosophy as a lie, beautiful words pasted over a thoroughly rotten system. They see America's culture of rights as a facade that merely reinforces traditional hierarchies of power instead of being the only culture that guarantees freedom for individuals. Disintegrationists attack on the values that build our nation are insidious because they replace each foundational belief from the right, uh, rights of freedom of speech and self-defense to the importance of marriage and faith communities with nothing more than an increased reliance on the government. This twisted disintegrationist vision replaces the traditional unionist understanding that all Americans are united in a shared striving toward the perfection of universal ideals. How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps shows that to be a cohesive nation, we have to uphold foundational truths about ourselves, our history, and reality itself. To be unionist instead of disintegrationist. Shapiro offers a vital warning that if we don't recover these shared truths, our future, our union, as a great country is threatened with destruction. So the reason why it's the most timely book of 2020 is because of when this book was written, like when the manuscript was delivered, and then also when, when this was released. So this was released early in 2020, but this was finished. This book was finished in 2019. So that's pre 
COVID. That's pre George Floyd, pre Rayshard Brooks. That's pre all the rioting and looting. That's pre election 2020. That's pre anything that happened in 2020. And here he is going into a very dense book. Again, Ben Shapiro doesn't write long books, but he writes very, very dense books. And he's talking about these enormous topics. And it could not have been released in a better year because this book is describing the chaos that is coming from people that are trying to tear down the American system from the inside. And we've seen that in, in full throated support from a lot of people in, in Congress, uh, people across the country. And we've just seen that just in general vernacular on, on Facebook or Twitter or in your conversations at the coffee shop. So there couldn't have been a more timely release of a book than this. And also for, for any of you history buffs that listen to this podcast around the middle part of this book, maybe into the second half of the book, there's an, a tremendous chapter that kind of gives a, a history, a historical retelling of how we got to where we are right now as a country. And it goes back way before the revolution. It was incredible. I mean, I'm sitting here reading this section of this, you know, difficult book and I'm just enthralled with the story of America. And again, he's got pages and pages and pages of footnotes. So this isn't him just papering over anything. He talks about the evils of slavery. He talks about how the, the Native Americans were treated in the Trail of Tears. And as an Oklahoman, I learned about the Trail of Tears in Oklahoma history classes growing up. So it's obviously very near and dear to my heart. I'm Choctaw Indian. So he doesn't glaze over any of America's sins, but he's basically making the argument that we can't be judged based solely on our sins because then there's not a great country or a great people that has ever lived. So <clears throat> incredibly tiny. Timely, timely book, but I'm going to give you my favorite quote here from the book. There's a lot of quotes. This one's just my favorite. Typically, courts have attempted to read the Bill of Rights to separate two requirements regarding religion. The requirement that Congress not establish an official religion and that Congress not prohibit the free exercise of religion. But this provision was meant to be read in tandem. In order to allow for the free exercise of religion, the government could not establish any particular sect and the founders did not believe that religion was to be relegated to the realm of thought. They fully understood that living religiously required exercise of religion, not merely thought or worship. A large variety of states made specific provisions exempting religious groups from generally applicable laws, for example. So there are a lot of great things. You know, that was kind of the best one that I could just take and give to you. But the most timely book of 2020, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps by Ben Shapiro. Next book here. The most challenging book that I read in 2020, and that is Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Life-Changing Truth for a Skeptical World, and this is by Josh and Sean McDowell. It was released in 2017. Here's the description. Equip yourself to present and defend the claims of Christian faith. The truth of the Bible doesn't change, but its critics do. Now with his son, Sean McDowell, Josh McDowell has updated and expanded the modern apologetics classic for the for a new generation. Evidence that demands a verdict provides expansive defense of Christianity's core truths and thoughtful responses to the Bible's most difficult and extraordinary passages. It invites readers to bring their doubts and doesn't shy away from tough questions. Topics and questions are covered in four parts. Evidence for the Bible. Evidence for Jesus. Evidence for the Old Testament. Evidence for truth. Serving as a go-to reference for even the toughest questions, evidence that demands a verdict continues to encourage and strengthen millions by providing Christians the answers they need to defend their faith against the harshest critics and skeptics. So why this is the most challenging book that I read in 2020 has a lot to do with just the length of this book. Okay. Cause again, like I told you, I don't read a lot during the day and I also don't read very quickly. It's hard for me to remember things. This book is just a tick under 900 pages long. Okay. And one thing about it is I didn't look at this book appropriately as I was going in. Cause you could even see from the description in the last paragraph, of the description, this is a go-to reference book. So again, if you have reference books in your library, these are typically not books that you read from cover to cover. These are books that you reference when there's a subject that comes up, which even more so makes me think that it's important for you to have this digitally so that you can just control F uh, or, or command F and find something in the passage. You can just search for it very easily. But I read this cover to cover and it took me, I want to say five months to finish this book. And I wasn't really reading anything else in between. This was after sweet baby James was born. Uh, man, it is such a dense book. It goes into so many theological categories, so many philosophical categories. It was just an incredibly, incredibly difficult book to get through. But I don't want that to dissuade you from getting it because if I had read this book properly, 
if I had cherry picked this book, if I didn't do my type A competitive thing where it's like, no, I'm going to read from cover to cover, no matter how hard it is, because I'm resilient or whatever, then it would have been maybe a more enjoyable book for me to read because there were a lot of subject matters that were completely over my head or that I just didn't give the, the proper amount of time and study and dedication to. But that book is going to be a book that is going to be referenced a lot as I build a uh, content out for undaunted life, as I just have conversations with people, as, as I just share ideas and philosophical underpinnings with, with individuals, this book is going to be a tremendous key for that. So it was a challenging book, but it's a very, very valuable book. But here's my favorite quote from this book. The resurrection is such a significant and momentous event that without its reality, the early Christian church could not have come into existence. Christianity was a movement begun by Jews in Jerusalem, not because they were all tired of Judaism and wanted to invent something new, but because of something that they experienced. They really believed Jesus had risen. Any theory that attempts to explain away the historicity of the resurrection must provide an alternate, uh, an alternate explanation for the origin of the church. And yet the first and consistent testimony of the church is that Jesus rose from the grave. Guys, that is a great apologetic there. Because these people that did not, they, you know, they're like, oh, you know, those 500 people that claim to see him, not only was that just recorded in the Bible, you know, you know, that could have been something where they all just kind of were seeing visions all at the same time. And it was just all the explanations around how the church could even survive the first century pale in comparison to the explanation that all these people believe that they saw a risen Jesus Christ three days after he was crucified on a Roman cross. So it's a good reminder there. So again, the most challenging book of 2020 Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Life-Changing Truth for a Skeptical World by Josh and Sean McDowell. Next category here, new one. I changed one up from last year. It's the best classic book of 2020 that I took down, and that is The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, written by Mark Twain, and it was released in 1876. Yeah, 1876. Here's the description for any of you guys that have been living under a rock and have never heard of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer is an intelligent, resourceful orphan who enjoys a life of freedom, unsheltered from life's hardships, the life that most children secretly, or not so secretly, yearn for. He is an immediately attractive character who draws the reader through his adventures, falling in love, being dumped, becoming a pirate, being thought to be dead, fearing that he would surely die, uncovering a murder, finding hidden treasure, and all the while skipping school and playing pranks. Twain's characters are surprising, unforgettable, and truly human. His dialogue faithfully reproduces the common speech of his day in all its very dialects. The plot combines adventure, suspense, and mischief with the darker side of humanity, murder, deceit, brutality, and racial prejudice. Twain's trademark humor and observation of human nature are never far. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer was initially a commercial failure, but in his lifetime, it was his best-selling book, and today is regarded by many as a masterpiece of American literature. So why it's the best uh, classic book of 2020 is because, again, I don't take down a lot of fiction. And if you're going to be reading classics, you're going to be taking down fiction. I've got some in the hopper for 2021, but I just figured that I would take this book down and I actually listened to this book this year. So again, I think it's kind of weird counting books that you read as book that you listen to, but I thought that that was a fa fantastic read. It's, it's a free thing that you can find on most podcasts. I forget the name of the company that put it together, but you can just search for it wherever you get your podcast. But I just remember being a kid and one of my favorite movies as a kid was Tom and Huck. So it was Jonathan Taylor Thomas and some other kid. And it was just so much fun hearing these stories being read back and it being so true to that movie. But then there were a lot of things that were left out. Obviously, there's the use of the N-word in this book. There's some some crazy things about different murders. And like it, it is kind of a, a crazy story, but it's an incredibly enjoyable story. And to think that this book is, you know, almost I, I mean 150 years old, like that's just a crazy thing that we can be still entertained by that in our modern sensibilities. And I'm not going to give you a favorite quote from this because, again, most of it is dialogue. But my favorite story from that book is where Tom and Huckleberry Finn, they fall through the ceiling at their own funerals. So everyone in town thinks that they're dead. They're all lamenting and they're watching their own funeral <clears throat> from the attic of the church. And they're seeing all these people and they're starting to feel a little bit sad. And then they fall through the roof. Because if you just think about how insanely funny and crazy and emotional that would be, imagine being at a funeral for somebody, right? I mean, just think about that. Most of us don't like thinking about that. And then all of a sudden that person falls through the ceiling. You know, it's a closed casket ceremony. And then that person's alive. Like, you know, the elation and relief and, and anger would all be there in that moment. I think Mark T Twain did an amazing job of describing that moment for the reader. So that's my favorite story from the book. But again, the best classic book of 2020, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. 
Next one here is the most useful book of 2020, and this is going to blow some of you away. I actually am choosing The Communist Manifesto. Okay, so that is by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, and that is from 1848, so even older than the last book by Mark Twain. But here's the description of the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto, originally titled Manifesto of the Communist Party, is a short 1848 book written by the German Marxist political theorists, Mark Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. It has since been recognized as one of the world's most influential political manuscripts. Commissioned by the Communist League, it laid out the League's purposes and program. It presents an analytical approach to the class struggle, historical and present, and the problems of capitalism rather than a prediction of communism's potential future forms. The book contains Marx and Engels' Marxist theories about the nature of society and politics that, in their own words, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. It also briefly features their ideas for how the capitalist society of the time would be eventually replaced by socialism and then eventually communism. So why is this the most useful book of 2020? You might be like, Kyle, what are you doing? Have you been smoking? This is a little bit weird. The reason why this is the most, most useful book of 2020 is because of all the ideologies that are permeating throughout our culture right now. Obviously, if you go back to my Race in America series, I talk at, at length about Black Lives Matter, specifically, and I talk a little bit about Antifa. Well, this is the book for those people. This is the Bible to those people. There, there's no book that they hold in higher regard than the Communist Manifesto. And the reason why this is the most useful book is because most people don't have the foggiest freaking idea what Marxism is. I remember being on my back porch with one of my buddies were having a cigar and a, and a, you know, having a drink. And I think I've told this before I mentioned Marxism and he just looked at me with this blank look and I'm like, yeah, you know, you know, like Marxism. He's like, what, what's that? I was like, you've never heard of Marxism. No, he didn't just not know what it was. He had never heard of it. This is a college graduate, you know, a guy with a family, like, but again, he's one of those guys that hasn't read a book probably since he graduated high school. He just, he had no clue. And so he's looking at Black Lives Matter and he's looking at these things happening in culture. He's looking at AOC and the rest of the squad and they're pushing for socialist things, which obviously, as you can tell by the description of this book, eventually leads to communism and all the bloodshed they're in. He had no clue. And the Communist Manifesto, you can pay money for it, which is hilarious, by the way, and super ironic, or you can just get it for free. Like I got it for free on my iBooks app. You can get it for free just about anywhere. It's, it's a manuscript, so it's not very long. You can even get uh, free versions on podcast formats and things like that. But if you're going to claim Marxism, if you're going to point your finger at Black Lives Matter and point your finger at AOC and Bernie Sanders and, you know, anyone else on that side of the aisle and talk about how Marxist their ideology is, and yet you haven't read this book, that's like quoting scripture, having never read the Bible. And you guys see that a lot in politics, right? You even had Gavin Newsom the other day, the, the governor of California who broke his own protocols and went to some Napa Valley restaurant, you know, this without masks and no social distancing and all that. And then he got out on his press conference and did his little apology. And he's like, yeah, you know, sometimes we, you know, we all fall short as humans. And so he, he neglected to talk about the uh, falling short of the glory of God. And, you know, we all, you know, <laughs> he just couldn't quite get there. He couldn't quite get to that point. He couldn't quite go to the scriptures, but it's the same exact thing. You can't really claim Marxism just because you've heard Ben Shapiro say it, or just because you've heard, you know, Bill O'Reilly say it. You've got to look at it from a more intrinsic point of view. You've got to know what these ideas mean. And I'm going to read you a quote from the Communist Manifesto. This is how the Communist Manifesto ends. So this is a quote for any of you guys that have friends that are like, oh, communism's not that bad. Oh, it's not really that big of a deal. Or, oh, you know, it's kind of an innocent ideology. Oh, it's just some old German dude that was just pontificating. Here's a quote from the very, very end. In short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Now, doesn't that sound vaguely familiar? Don't those ideas sound very, very familiar? 
It's because they're being spouted from some of the highest places in government in the United States and across the world, frankly. And you would think after the 20th century, all the bloodshed under communist rule, under atheistic communist rule, that we would have learned. But we've got dummies that are being taught by all these leftist teachers, K through 12, and then into college, and they don't learn about this. The, the percentage of students, public school students in America, that grow up having never learned about the Holocaust is astounding. They don't know who Chairman Mao is. They've never heard of Joseph Stalin. And then when they hear some of these socialist ideas, they can get on board. There, there are guys in my foxhole that we read this as, as part of our, our foxhole curriculum this, this summer. You know, it was just something interesting for all of us. And when you were, read the first 20 or 25 pages, you can kind of find yourself like nodding to some of the sentiments. Like, oh yeah, I get it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. But then you have to keep reading because they, they, they put a little sugar on top of the turds. But you, you got to keep digging down until you get to the turds. So guys, the most useful book of 2020. The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Next one here, we've got the most impactful book of 2020, and that is Abortion, A Rational Look at an Emotional Issue by R.C. Sproul, and this was released in 1990. Here we go into the description. In this book, Dr. R.C. Sproul employs his unique perspective as a highly experienced pastor theologian and a trained philosopher to provide well-considered and compassionate answers to the difficult questions that attend terminating a pregnancy. Dr. Sproul strives for a factual, well-reasoned approach informed by careful biblical scholarship. He considers both sides of this issue in terms of biblical teaching, civil law, and natural law. This edition includes a new foreword by Dr. George Grant and has been updated to reflect developments in the issue of abortion. Appendices provide further background on the issue and when life begins in a list of sources for pro-life people. The chapters are listed as follows. <clears throat> a Nation Divided, The Sanctity of Life, The Sanctity of Life and Natural Law, when does life begin? What if you are not sure about abortion? The role of government in abortion? A woman's right to her body? Three frequent assertions? The pro-choice position? The problem of unwanted pregnancies? Is abortion the unpardonable sin? And a pro-life strategy. Okay. So why this is the most impactful book of 2020 shouldn't be a surprise to you. Uh, this is a classic book in the world of abortion. It's a book that I had never read up to this point. So I'm kind of surprised that I hadn't read it before this year. But guys, I talk about it all the time. This is my one issue. If you're going to have one issue, the murder of innocent uh, you know, boys and girls in the womb, that, that's one. That's a hill to die on, right? Don't die on the hill of immigration. Don't die on the hill of taxation. Don't die on the hill of foreign policy. You die on this hill, okay? But a lot of times, even in pro-life circles, you're not going to get the most reasoned arguments, right? You're going to get someone that just starts screaming, ah, you're murdering babies, and then they just don't have any context they don't have any philosophical underpinnings to the things that they're saying. And they're going to be talking to somebody that literally looks at a nine you know, month pregnant woman thinking that what's inside her is still just like this glob of cells that have just been kind of, you know, amoeba together. And, you know, it's not going to confer personhood until it comes through the vaginal canal. And you've got to be able to engage with someone like that. And if you don't have a philosophical approach, if you don't have an approach that is going to be convincing to that person, you're probably not going to sway them. So I'm going to go ahead and give you my favorite quote from this book here. Here we go. At what line must freedom of choice end? I believe it ends where my freedom of choice steps on another person's inalienable rights of life and liberty. No unborn baby has ever had the right to choose or deny its own destruction. Indeed, as others have said, the most dangerous place in the United States for a human being is inside the womb of a woman. For millions of unborn babies, the womb has become a cell on death row. The inmate is summarily executed without benefit of a trial or a word of defense. This execution literally involves being torn limb from limb. Is this destruction or description too graphic? Is it too emotionally provocative? No. It would be only if the description were untrue. The right to choose, as sacred as it may be, does not carry with it the arbitrary right to destroy a human life. This is as much a miscarriage of justice as it is a miscarriage of a human baby. Just an absolutely brutal throat punch to anyone that thinks we should be able to murder babies in the womb. The most impactful book that I took down in 2020, Abortion, A Rational Look at an Emotional Issue by R.C. Sproul.
Next one here, we've got my most entertaining book that I took down in 2020, and that is The Terminal List by Jack Carr. That was released back in 2018, so obviously we had him recently here on the podcast to talk about The Terminal List and also the subsequent novels, uh, True Believer, Sa- Savage Son, and then the upcoming The Devil's Hand that's going to be released in April of next year. But let me go ahead and give you the description of The Terminal List. A Navy SEAL has nothing left to live for and everything to kill for after he discovers that the American government is behind the deaths of his team in this ripped from the headlines political thriller that is, quote, so powerful, so pulse pounding, so well written, rarely do you read a debut novel this damn good, unquote. That's from Brad Thor. On his last combat deployment, Lieutenant Commander James Reese's entire team was killed in a catastrophic ambush. But when those dearest to him are murdered on the day of his homecoming, Reese discovers that this was not an act of war by a foreign enemy, but a conspiracy that runs to the highest levels of government. Now, with no family and free from the military's command structure, Reese applies the lessons that he's learned in over a decade of constant warfare towards avenging the deaths of his family and teammates. With breathless pacing and relentless suspense, Reese ruthlessly targets his enemies in the upper echelons of power without regard for the law of combat or the rule of law. So the reason why this was the most entertaining book of 2020, again, is because I don't do fiction. Fiction's hard for me to follow, especially some of these books. You know, I didn't really find out about Jack Carr until Savage Sun was released. So that's three novels in. It's like, well, crap, you can't just kind of skip around, even though that that's what Joe Rogan did before he had Jack Carr on the podcast. But I went back to this book. I had tokens or whatever they're called on uh, Audible. And so I got all three of those books. I had some long drives uh, that, that I was on. And so I took down the terminal list. And I just got to be honest with you guys. It reminded me when I was reading the Dan Brown novels back in the day. So Angels and Demons and the Da Vinci Code and, uh, you know, Inferno and some of those types of things. Those were just spellbounding books. And they were like 500 page books that had like 200 chapters. And so you could read two or three pages and then go on to the next thing and go on to the next thing. So it had that feel to it, but it was super militaristic. Right. So it was obviously a a former Navy SEAL that is trying to to avenge himself. But I just found myself in this book. You know, when you're reading a thriller, yeah, your heart rate will get up and you're like, oh, what's going to happen? And you just got to make sure that you can read some more to where you can kind of take down the content. But there were different times when I was, you know, listening to this book where, I mean, I was just overcome with emotion, you know, overcome with sadness for the main character, overcome with anger for him, overcome with, with different things in to, to have something like a book elicit that time type of an emotion for some of you guys, you don't even get that type of emotion from real life circumstances. But I just remember seeing myself being like, man, this freaking sucks. Like, what would I do in this situation? But it was an absolute thrill ride. Um, you know, there are some arguments to be made that me and savage son is probably the, the, fan favorite of the three so far that have been released. And that is an incredible one, but guys, I could not recommend these more highly to you. Um, and the thing is, is I can't really give you a quote because there's a lot of context. I don't want to give you any spoilers, spoilers, but I will provide for you my favorite review of this book by anybody. So here's the favorite review quote. Jack Carr's many years of experience as a Navy SEAL gives him unique insight and abilities to write an extremely unique thriller. The pages turn uh, fast as you get inside the head of a warrior. Absolutely intense, unquote. Now, it doesn't seem like that crazy of a review, but it's from Chuck Norris. All right, so Chuck Norris has read this book. He thinks it's awesome. And if you don't think that's awesome, then you're not awesome. So definitely take down that book. That is the most entertaining book I took down in 2020, The Terminal List by Jack Carr. Here we go to the next one, the best reread book of 2020. And so that was the 5,000 year leap, 28 ideas that are changing the world. So every year I try to reread at least one or two books from the past. I try not to reread a book that I just read the previous year, or previous year uh, but this book is by W. Cleon Skozen, I think is how you say it. So I'll spell out the last name, S-K-O-U-S-E-N. This was released back in 2007. Let me give you the description here. The nation the founders built is now in the throes of a political, economic, social, and spiritual crisis that has driven many to an almost frantic search for modern solutions. Crazy that this was written, you know, so long ago. The truth is that the solutions have been available for a long time in the writings of our founding fathers, carefully set forth in this timely book. In the 5,000 year leap, a miracle that changed the world, Discover the 28 principles of freedom our founding fathers said must be understood and perpetuated by every people who desire peace, prosperity, and freedom. Learn how to, how adherence to these beliefs during the past 200 years has brought about more progress than was made in the previous 5,000 years. These 28 principles include the genius of natural law, virtuous and moral leaders, equal rights, not equal things, and avoiding the burden of debt. 
So the reason why this is the best reread of 2020 is just because of how applicable it is. The last time I read this was about four years ago. Uh, this is when I first started going to our like Sunday night jujitsu thing. This was one of the books that we were doing at that time. And at that time, there weren't really a lot of crazy things going on. Uh, Barack Obama was still president. Donald Trump hadn't been elected yet. And, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of consternation going on. There were some concerns about what Barack Obama was doing to the country, the direction that he was sending it, um, you know, just the disdain that he and the people of his ilk had for Christians and conservatives and kind of what you were made to feel if you were a traditional conservative American. But the reminders of what the founding fathers believed and wrote is a refreshing thing because a common refrain now is that the founding fathers were deists at best. These were not people that believed in God. They certainly didn't believe in the Christian God. And people are just accepting that as truth. Again, being taught by K through 12, you know, teachers in the United States, they're, they're not getting the real history. So this is a really good book. I will say that there are some things that the author says at different points where he doesn't provide some sort of a footnote. He's kind of inferring his own personality and his own opinion, but he does kind of separate his opinion from factual readings throughout the book. I feel like you can get that. And I'm going to go ahead and read several of my favorite quotes because this, this is kind of a through point of this book. And so all of these quotes, I think, kind of attach to one another as you go and read through the 28 principles that are brought through. So we're going to go ahead and start with the quotes and I'll just kind of let you know when I'm going on to the next one. So here's the first one here. The thinking of, of Polybius, Cicero, Thomas Hooker, Coke, Montesquieu, Blackstone, John Locke, and Adam Smith salt and peppered their writings and their conversations. They were also careful students of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and even though some did not belong to any Christian denomination, the teachings of Jesus were held in universal respect and admiration. Obviously, this is referring to the Founding Fathers. Let's go to the next quote here. John Adams pointed out why the future of the United States depended upon the level of virtue and morality maintained among the people. He said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Next quote here. The American Founding Fathers agreed with Locke. They considered the existence of the Creator as the most fundamental premise underlying all self-evident truth. It will be noted as we proceed through this study that every single self-evident truth enunciated by the Founders is rooted in the presupposition of a divine Creator. Next quote here. Last one, actually. After being elected president, Washington stressed these sentiments in his first inaugural address when he said, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men, more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of the independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. So guys, very, very good book. If you're interested in the founding fathers and some of the things that they thought, philosophically, theologically, great, great book. The best reread of 2020, The 5,000 Year Leap. 28 Ideas That Are Changing the World by W. Cleon Skozen. So now we've got a few categories left. I think we've got three books left. This is the most disappointing book of 2020. But this one's a little bit different than the ones in the past years. Some in the past years were just absolutely awful from, from cover to cover. Some just didn't really hit the mark that I thought they should. But this is the most disappointing book I read this year. It's called Alone at Dawn. Medal of Honor recipient John Chapman and the Untold Story of the World's Deadliest Special Operations Force. This is by Dan Schilling and Chapman Lori uh, Longfritz. I think I got her name wrong. I think it's uh, Lori Chapman Longfritz. Anyway, and that was released last year in 2019. But let me go and read the description to you here. The New York Times bestselling true account of John Chapman, Medal of Honor recipient and Special Ops Combat Controller, and his heroic one-man stand during the Afghan war as he sacrificed his life to save the lives of 23 comrades in arms. In the pre-dawn hours of March 4, 2002, just below the 10,469-foot peak of, the mountain in east, of a mountain in eastern Afghanistan, a fierce battle raged. Outnumbered by Al-Qaeda fighters, Air Force Combat Controller John Chapman and a handful of Navy SEALs struggled to take a summit in the desperate bid to find a lost teammate. Chapman, leading the charge, was gravely wounded in the initial assault. Believing he was dead, his SEAL leader ordered a retreat. Chapman regained consciousness alone, with the enemy closing in on three sides. John Chapman's subsequent display of incredible valor, valor, first saving the lives of his SEAL teammates and then, knowing he was mortally wounded, single-handedly engaging two dozen hardened fighters to save the lives of an incoming rescue squad, posthumously earned him the Medal of Honor. Chapman and his first airman, 
is the first airman in nearly 50 years to be given the distinction reserved for America's greatest heroes. Alone at Dawn is also a behind the scenes look at the Air Force combat controllers, the world's deadliest, deadliest and most versatile special operations force, whose members must not only exceed the qualifications of Navy SEAL and Army Delta Force teams, but also act with sharp decisiveness and deft precision, even in the face of life-threatening danger. Drawing from first-hand accounts, classified documents, dramatic video footage, and extensive interviews with leaders and survivors of the operation, Alone at Dawn is the story of an extraordinary man's brave last stand in the brotherhood that forged him. So after reading that description, you might be shocked that I have this as my most disappointing book that I took down in 2020. But this is why it was the most disappointing book of 2020. This is another book that I listened to on Audible. And... I don't know if I had sullied myself a little bit before I went into reading this, but it's kind of one of those things when you're uh, about to purchase the book, you can kind of flip through the reviews real quick. And the very, very first review that I saw was a one or two star review that basically said, you know, this was an awesome story, but this is a terrible retelling of it. I don't even understand what's happening. Um, it's in a very confusing read. The person's voice is not pleasant, blah, blah, blah. And I read that and then I started listening to it. So I kind of had that in the back of my mind that this was going to be hard to follow. But then that's exactly what I found to be the case. I felt like the narrative being spun in this book was incredibly hard to follow. When I've read other military memoirs, right? You know, whenever you read Extreme Ownership or Lone Survivor or, uh, you know, Fearless or any of those types of things, you can find yourself there. American Sniper. I mean, you can kind of see yourself in those situations. You, you can almost, you know, imagine like you were there if you were like, you know, holding a camera, like being a part of the action and kind of seeing these things happen. And I just didn't get that from this book. Okay. But with the other books that I've put in this category, most disappointing, this is a book that I would still recommend to you. Because I think this was a me problem. I mean, this is like 4.9 out of 5 on Amazon with like over 5,000 reviews. So obviously I feel like I missed the mark, okay? So I think what I'm going to try to do maybe this next year is I'm going to maybe try to actually read it myself as opposed to listening to it. Because again, I listen to things at two times speed. You know, I can't bring myself to listen to it any slower. Perhaps I missed out on some things. And also I felt like there was kind of a whiny undertone of this. Because they were obviously talking about Air Force combat controllers, who they are the most deadly uh, operation, special operations force. But it seemed like they, they kind of had an axe to grind with Delta Force, an axe to grind with the Green Berets, an axe to grind with Navy SEALs. And they were, it was almost like a jealous little brother, kind of at different points, describing the Air Force combat controllers and how hard they got it and how smart they have to be and all those things. And so that kind of struck me as odd. It wasn't really fun to, to kind of listen to someone describe it in that way. But again, I feel like this might be a me problem. So I would highly suggest that you still take this book down, but that was the most disappointing book that I took in for 2020. Alone at Dawn, Medal of Honor recipient, John Chapman and the untold story of the world's deadliest special, uh, oh gosh, I cut, I cut off the, the deadliest special, uh, operations force. Goodness guys. Hey, we're doing it live, so we're just going to keep going. And again, that is by Dan Schilling and Lori, I think it's Chapman Longfritz. I think I just got the uh, the name mixed up here. Okay, so now we got the two final ones left. So we're about to get to my best book of 2020, the best book that I took in. But this one is almost the best book of 2020. Okay, it, I mean, it was right there. I mean, I spent weeks thinking about which book that I was going to put in there for the best book of 2020. But this one was almost it, but it got, you know, just basically edged out by another one. So the almost best book of 2020 is The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure by Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt. And that was released last year in 2019. Let me give you the description here. Something has been going wrong on many college campuses in the last few years. Speakers are shouted down. Students and professors saying they are walking on eggshells and are afraid to speak honestly. Rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide are rising on campus as well as nationally. How did this happen? First Amendment expert Greg Lukanoff and social psychologist Jonathan Haidt show how the new problems on campus have their origins in three terrible ideas that have become increasingly woven into American childhood and education. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings. And life is a battle between good people and evil people. These three great untruths contradict basic psychological principles about well-being and ancient wisdom from many cultures. Embracing these untruths and the resulting culture of safetyism interferes with young people's social, emotional, and intellectual development. 
It makes it harder for them to become autonomous adults who are able to navigate the bumpy roads of life. Lukanoff and Haidt investigate the many social trends that have intersected to promote the spread of these untruths. They explore changes in childhood, such as the rise of fearful parenting, the decline of unsupervised child-directed play, and the new role of social media that has engulfed teenagers in the last decade. They examine changes on campus, including the corporatization of universities and the emergence of new ideas about identity and justice. They situate the conflicts on campus within the context of America's rapidly rising political polarization and dysfunction. This is a book for anyone who is confused by what is happening on college campuses today or has children or is concerned about the growing inability of Americans to live, work, and cooperate across party lines. Okay, so guys, this is an incredibly fun book. And it was a incredibly, incredibly insightful book. And these are not from kind of your normal, you know, right wing sources that you would think would be talking about these types of things. I believe both of these guys would consider themselves to be on the liberal left side of the political spectrum. But the reason why it was almost the best book of 2020 is simply because the ideas were so incredible to try to take in because everyone's trying to explain why this common generation, why, why this latest generation is acting in the way that it's acting. And I feel like he breaks it down and these, both of these authors break it down in such an incredible way. But again, it it comes down to three terrible ideas. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings. And life is a battle between good people and evil people. And guys, I I don't really want to give away too much of this book because I I almost demand that you read it. It is an incredibly, incredibly important book, but I will give you my favorite quote. And it's this. The bottom line is that when members of iGen, that's what they're calling basically this this latest generation, arrived on campus beginning in the fall of 2013, they had accumulated less unsupervised time and fewer offline experiences than had any previous generation. As Twingy points out, I'm not sure who that is uh, from the context of it, quote, 18-year-olds now act like 15-year-olds used to, and 13-year-olds act like 10-year-olds. Teens are physically safer than ever, yet they are more mentally vulnerable, unquote. Most of these trends are showing up across social classes, races, and ethnicities. Members of iGen, therefore, may not, on average, be as ready for college as were 18-year-olds of previous generations. This might explain why college students are suddenly asking for more protection and adult intervention in their affairs and interpersonal conflicts. So, Obviously, I think a lot of people, you know, they like to talk about the previous generations like, oh, you know, these these millennials are so soft or this Gen Y people or they just don't know what they're talking about. But I think it's a a stunted maturity. I, I think it's clearly a stunted maturity to where it makes perfect sense that they're 18 years old and that they've been on this earth for 18 years. But as they go into college, they don't have the maturity of an 18 year old. Because I remember, you know, obviously I did some dumb things. I was kind of a class clown, but I was always a mature kid. You know, my parents were always, uh, you know, complimented on how mature I was and how I acted in certain situations. Yeah, I was a rambunctious kid, but I was a mature kid. I didn't get into, you know, you know, really serious trouble. But whenever I was 18, you know, I wasn't kicked out of my house, but I moved away to college knowing that I was never coming back. And it didn't have to be explained. Oh, hey, son, by the way, uh, as soon as you move out, your room is being changed into a guest room or into a storage room or something like that. There was no definitive thing that was discussed. But at the end of the day, it was important for my family to, to basically create this environment where it's like, all right, you're on your own. We had you for 18 years. We got you all squared away. And now we're moving on. And I feel like this generation that is coming up is not getting that at all. And it was an important book for me to read as I consider how I'm going to be a father to sweet baby James, the things that I'm going to allow him to struggle with, the things that he's not going to get from his schooling that I got from mine and that my wife got from hers. And this resilience that kids just don't have and this desire to be kept safe by some adult or you know, when their team gets beat really, really, really bad in baseball or football or basketball, how all the parents on their team start yelling at the parents on the other team for how mean they're being for running up the score. And I'm going to be more sensitive to those things and be looking for those things so that I can challenge those terrible ideologies that lead to a weak kid. So the almost best book of 2020, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure by Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt. So We've gotten all the way to the end of the podcast, and here we are, the best book that I read in 2020, and the only reason that I picked this over the previous book, The Coddling of the American Mind, 
is because it was actually released in 2020. So I thought it was important to finally have a book that was the book of the year that was released in the year that I'm talking about it. So the best book of 2020, Fortitude, American Resilience in an Era of Outrage by Dan Crenshaw, released this year. Again, that is Representative Dan Crenshaw and retired Navy SEAL. Here is the description. Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life meets Jocko Willink and Leif Babin's Extreme Ownership in this tough love leadership book from a Navy SEAL and rising star in Republican politics. In 2012, on his third tour of duty, an improvised explosive device left Dan Crenshaw's right eye destroyed and his left blinded. Only through the careful hand of his surgeons and what doctors called a miracle did Crenshaw's left eye recover partial vision. And yet he persevered, completing two more deployments. Why? There are certain stories we can tell ourselves about the hardships we face. We can become paralyzed by adversity or we can adapt and overcome. We can be fragile or we can find our fortitude. Crenshaw delivers a set of lessons to help you do just that. Most people's everyday challenges aren't as extreme as surviving combat, and yet our society is more fragile than ever, exploding with outrage, drowning in microaggressions, and devolving into divisive mob politics. The American spirit, long characterized by grit and fortitude, is unraveling. We must fix it. That's exactly what Crenshaw accomplishes with fortitude. This book isn't about the problem, it's about the solution. And that solution begins with each and every one of us. We must all lighten up, toughen up, and begin treating our fellow Americans with respect and grace. Fortitude is a no-nonsense advice book for finding the strength to deal with everything from menial daily frustrations to truly difficult challenges. More than that, it is a roadmap for a more resilient American culture. With meditations and perseverance on perseverance, failure, and finding much-needed heroes, the book is the antidote for a prevailing safety culture of trigger warnings and safe places. Interspersed with lessons from history and psychology is Crenshaw's own story of how an average American kid from the Houston suburbs went from war zones to the halls of Congress and managed to navigate his path with a sense of humor and an even greater sense that, no matter what anyone else around us says or does, we are in control of our own destiny. So guys, uh, I read this book on my own this year, and then I also read it with my foxhole. And the reason why it's the best book of 2020 is because this is like the book that kind of goes on the heels of what was just described with the coddling of the American mind. In fact, I would suggest to you the first two books that you read this year in this order would be the coddling of the American mind and then fortitude. The reason for that is because the coddling of the American mind is a description of the problem. Whereas, as you saw from the description of fortitude, this is a description of the solution. This is one of the better, because this could be considered a a military memoir book. It could be considered a a modern philosophy book. It could be considered a self-help book, but the lessons are so unbelievably good from this book. Um, There's not a whole lot not to like about Dan Crenshaw. And I try not to be one of those people that as soon as, you know, someone gets into, you know, Congress and they're, they're kind of interesting and maybe they were a a former military member or maybe they were a former athlete and, you know, they've got some, some stars kind of around them, but this guy is, is legitimately going places. I think people are a little about uh, out over their skis thinking that he's going to run for president in 2024. As I've said before, I don't think he has the national name recognition for that. I think it's more realistic that he eventually runs for Senate in Texas or runs for governor of Texas and then, you know, several elections down the line that he could run for president. Who knows? It could be him on one side and AOC on the other. other. Wouldn't that be fun? But the way he thinks about ideas, the way he breaks down his philosophies and the way he explains it to you is incredibly unique and refreshing and very direct. And so I'm going to give you several favorite quotes. I think I had four quotes or five quotes that I pulled out from this book that I think is incredibly important for you to take in. So here's the first quote here. Outrage is weakness. It is the muting of rational thinking and the triumph of emotion. Despite what you've been hearing and seeing as of late, it is not a virtue. It is not something to be celebrated nor praised nor aspired to. It is a deeply human emotion, even understandable at times, but rarely is it productive, virtuous, or useful. It is an emotion to overcome, not accept, and overcoming it requires mental strength. This book is about acquiring that necessary mental fortitude. That's from the first chapter. It is amazing. Next quote here. Now, I wonder how a generation shaped by the comforts of victimhood culture, unaccustomed to adversity and allergic to sacrifice, with less and less desire to persevere or preserve our values and way of life, will react when we are faced with the next great war or depression or civil conflict. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Next quote here. What you should do is scatter challenges throughout your life. 
The nature and value of those challenges depend upon you, and those aren't singular, big goal challenges either. The pursuit of meaningful suffering must be habitual. I'll say that again. The pursuit of meaningful suffering must be habitual. It must be a new part of your routine where you dedicate yourself to occasional bouts of self-imposed suffering because deep down you know you have become too soft. Ooh, ooh, love that quote. Next one here. In the Christian sense, without suffering there can be no redemption, no mercy. In the raw humanistic sense, without suffering there can be no internal resilience to adversity, no proper preparedness for the future. Suffering, controlled by you and for the right cause, can be a building block for both spiritual health and mental toughness. In a liberty-based nation like the United States, where we are free to fail and to suffer, that fortitude is a welcome and necessary attribute. Rather than trying to erase suffering at every opportunity, we would all be wise to value it and seek it out. So, go do something hard. Doesn't that sound like something I've said before? Last quote from here, and it's a short one. A system that falsely promises the end of suffering also strips individuals of the capacity to deal with it. So guys, if you're not a self-help book person and you feel like this is a self-help book, this is probably going to be the most helpful self-help book that you could possibly have. But another thing is if you have teenagers, if you have a 15, 16, 17 year old, you got to read this book with them, male or female. And regardless of if you've applied these lessons to your own personal life, or if you've fallen short in these areas, none of that really matters. I really think this is one of the most important books that you could possibly read with your children. I can't wait to read it with my son. It's an incredible read. Guys, it is the best book of 2020, Fortitude, American Resilience in an Era of Outrage by Dan Crenshaw. So as we look forward to 2021, I like to kind of give you a list of some books that I have in the hopper. And if you listen to my last year's episode, I have a lot of the same books because a lot of the books I said I was going to read this year, I didn't end up reading. I read other books. I was preparing a lot for all those podcasts. We had a baby. Oh, excuses, excuses. I'll give you the list again, but there's one that wasn't from last year. And that is the devil's hand by Jack Carr. That is going to be released this coming year. And then also we got the carryovers from last year. The first one being beyond order 12 rules for life by Jordan Peterson. That is the follow-up book by Jordan Peterson. It was supposed to be released in 2019. Obviously you had trouble finishing the book. You had trouble basically staying alive at different points. So I'm sure we're going to hear about that. Then we have liberal fascism by Jonah Goldberg. Ordinary Men by Christopher R. Browning, The Arm by Jeff Passan, that's a baseball book. And then we have Martin Luther by Eric Metaxas, so that's a biography of Martin Luther. We have American Buffalo by Stephen Ranella, Call Sign Chaos by uh, General James Mattis, Jim Mattis, Not a Daycare by Everett Piper, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss and Tal Raz, Iron John by Robert Bly, and The Cross of Christ by John Stott. The only reason I still haven't read The Cross of Christ by John Stott is it's still like 30 bucks on iBooks. And I saw it go down to like $7.99 one day. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I didn't buy it. And then it shot right back up to 30 bucks. So I'll eventually be able to get that one. But guys, thanks so much for listening to this podcast. We really do appreciate it. I appreciate you taking down this list. If you look at the show notes, you will have the list of the books and where you can buy them. So if you would, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher, and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. If we reserve a five-star review, please leave us one. And I am currently booking speaking engagements for the entirety of 2021. So if you want to come speak to your team at your men's event, at your whatever, hit me up, info at undaunted.life. That's info at undaunted.life. The website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at undauntedlife or facebook.com backslash undauntedlife. Check out our free devotionals on the YouVersion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is our song Defender, which is off their latest record entitled Guardians. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, 